Hey guys, uh, Haley and I are here for our Wednesday night Bible study. Miss Jordan is on vacation, which means that she's having fun, and it means that we don't have our technology person here tonight. So we're going to try to press through and figure this one out. Um, but to review, we've been going through the New Testament books of the Bible. We started with Matthew, of course, and in Matthew, the big takeaway is the Great Commission. Um, Miss Haley, do you remember what the Great Commission is? I do. It's Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Good job. Every word. All right. Now, the book of Mark, our big takeaway, is the greatest commandment. What does that say? That is Mark 12. 30 and it says love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength the second is this love your neighbor as yourself there is no commandment greater than these all right in the book of luke there was one takeaway um it was kind of a name of christ what was that takeaway that he was what he was the son of man Right. All right. So that's kind of the name that the book of Luke kind of carries through with Jesus um, throughout his book. So tonight, what comes next? We got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right. So we are going to watch a video um, about the book of John. I'm trying to get that up right now. And um, let's see. It might take me just a second, but... I am there, I do believe, uh, almost. Nope, that's not it. Nope. Wait, I think this is it. The Gospel according to John. It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life, okay. and we learn at the end of the book that it comes. Okay, hang on. We're here. We're going to do this. Uh, I got to get back to my Zoom. Okay, are we sharing the screen yet? <gasps> there it is. Okay. From one of Jesus' closest followers called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John, the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later church as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly designed with a clear purpose that he states near the end. John says, the story is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John believes that the Jesus you read about in this book is alive and real, and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is really cool. Its first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story that's followed by then a big block of stories about Jesus performing miraculous signs that generate increasing controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign, the raising of Lazarus, which creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half. So the book opens with a two-part introduction. First, a poem that begins, in the beginning, was the word an obvious allusion to Genesis 1, when God created everything with his word. Now, a person's words, they're distinct from that person, but they're also the embodiment of that person's mind and will. And so John says that God's word was with God, that is distinct, and yet the word was God, that is divine. And as we ponder this claim, we hear later in the poem that this divine word became human in Jesus. Then John goes on to draw from the stories of Exodus, saying that Jesus was God's tabernacle in our midst. The glorious divine presence that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant became a human in Jesus. 
which leads to his last claim, that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Son, who has become human to reveal the Father to us. Now, as we consider these mind-bending claims, we then start to hear a story about how John the Baptist first met Jesus and then led other people to meet him and become his disciples. And one by one, as people encounter Jesus, they say out loud who they think he is. And in this one chapter, Jesus is given seven titles. Now, these titles prepare us for John's love of sevens in designing the book, but altogether they also make a claim that this fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king, he's the teacher of Israel, and he's the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. Now that's a big claim to make about someone, and John will now go on to support it through the stories in chapters 2 through 12. They all have the same basic pattern. Jesus will perform a sign or make a claim about himself, and that will result in misunderstanding or controversy. And so in the end of each story, people are forced to make a choice about who they think Jesus is. The first section shows Jesus encountering four classic Jewish institutions. And in each case, Jesus shows that he is the reality to which that institution pointed. So Jesus is at a wedding party and the wine runs out. And Jesus then turns these huge jugs of water, like 120 gallons total, into the best wine ever. And the head waiter says to the groom, you've saved the best wine for last, which is, of course, true. But John also calls this miracle Jesus' first sign. In other words, it's a symbol that reveals something about Jesus. So just as Isaiah said that the Messianic kingdom would be like this huge party with lots of good wine, so this first miraculous sign reveals the generosity of Jesus' kingdom. Next, Jesus goes to the Jerusalem temple, the place where heaven and earth were supposed to come together and God would meet with his people. And Jesus asserts his authority over it, running out all the money exchangers, stopping the sacrificial offerings. And when the temple leaders threaten him, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is claiming that his coming sacrificial death is where heaven and earth will truly meet together. His body that will be killed is the reality to which the temple building points. Then Jesus has this all-night conversation with a rabbi named Nicodemus, who thinks that Jesus is just like him, another rabbi and teacher for Israel. But Jesus says that Israel needs much more than just another teacher with new information. Israel needs a new heart and a new life. Or in his words, no one can experience God's kingdom without being born again. Jesus believes that humans are caught in a web of selfishness and sin that leads to death. But he also knows that God loves this world. And so he's here to offer people a new birth, a new chance at life. From here, Jesus travels north, and he ends up at a sacred well in a conversation with a Samaritan that is a non-Jewish woman. And they start talking about water, which Jesus turns into a metaphor for himself. He says he's here to bring living water that can become a source of eternal life. Now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that's infused with God's eternal love, and it's a life that can begin now and last on into the future. After this, John has designed another collection of stories that took place during four Jewish sacred days, or feasts. And again, Jesus uses the images related to the feasts to make claims about himself. So Jesus first heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, which starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. And Jesus says it's his father who's working on the Sabbath, and so is he. And they catch his meaning, that he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God, and so they want to kill him. The next story takes place during Passover, the feast that retold the Exodus story with the symbolic meal of the lamb and bread and wine. And Jesus miraculously provides food for a crowd of thousands, which results in people asking him for more bread. And then Jesus goes on to claim that he is the true bread, and if they eat him, they will discover eternal life. And this offends many people who stop following him. After this is a block of stories set in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, which retold the story of Israel's wilderness wanderings as God guided them with the pillar of cloud and fire and provided them water in the desert. And Jesus gets up in the temple courts and he shouts, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And then later he says, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be the illuminating presence of God and the life-saving gift of God to his people. And some people believe and follow him, but others are offended and still others try to kill him for these exalted claims. 
The final feast story is during Hanukkah, which means rededication. It's about how Judah Maccabee cleared the temple of idols and set it apart as holy once more. And Jesus goes into the temple area and says that he is the one who God has set apart as the holy one, and that he is the true temple where God's presence dwells. And he also says, I and the Father are one. This makes the Jerusalem leaders so angry, they set in motion a plan to kill Jesus, and so he retreats from the city. Now, all these conflicts, they culminate in one last miraculous sign. Jesus hears that his dear friend Lazarus is sick, but his family lives near Jerusalem, which is now a death trap for Jesus. Now, Jesus could stay away, and he would save his own life, but he loves Lazarus. So once he hears that Lazarus has died, he goes to raise him from the dead, and he calls him to life out of his tomb, knowing that it will cost him his own life. And the news of this amazing sign, it spreads quickly, of course, and just as Jesus knew it happened, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and begin conspiring to murder him. And so he rides into Jerusalem as Israel's king, who's rejected by its leader. So the first half of John draws to a close with this story about Jesus laying down his life as an act of love for his friend. And this, of course, is also a sign pointing forward to the cross, which we'll explore more in the next video. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel of John. All right, guys, let's see if Miss Haley, um, how well she paid attention. And we might sneak in a question for Lorelai, too. Um, since she joined us. Okay, so, uh, Laurel, I'm gonna give you this first one, okay? I'm gonna be easy on you, okay? Okay. All right, you ready for it? Mm -hmm. You're gonna fill in the blank, okay? Mm -hmm. The purpose of the book of John is communicated in the verse John chapter 20, verse 31. I'll read part of it and you fill in the blanks, okay? Okay. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have in his name good job life in his name all right so this one's gonna be for Haley okay (laughs) (laughs) the book of John gives Jesus a certain number of titles what is that specific number Miss Haley was it seven it was seven seven is a very important number in the Bible um, also, let's see, Miss Haley, let's see if she can get it. If you can't get it, then maybe Lorelai remembers. In John chapter 3, there's a rabbi. His name, you can, don't fill in the blank yet. His name is blank. Jesus explained to him that a person had to be born again to become a member of God's family. Who was that guy? Hmm. Was it Nicodemus? <laughs> It was. Good job. Thank you. (laughs) I did not know that. (laughs) All right. So we are going to finish. We're going to um, watch another video of the book of John. And let's see if I got this right. I think this was just the right one. Let's see. The Gospel According nope. to John. <laughs> we are right there. Is the Messiah, the Son of God, the human embodiment of God's word and glorious presence who has come to reveal who God truly is? Then we explored how John designed the first half of the book to demonstrate this claim. Jesus performed miraculous signs and made huge claims about himself, that he is the reality to which Israel's entire history points. And this all generates controversy, however, and the Jewish leaders confront Jesus for all these claims, and it culminated with Jesus laying down his life for his friend Lazarus. By going near Jerusalem to raise him from the dead, Jesus sealed his fate. And so once the plot to murder Jesus is set in motion, we come into the book's second half. The first part focuses entirely on Jesus' final night and last words to the disciples as he tries to prepare them for his coming death. Jesus performs this shocking act at dinner. He takes on the role of a common servant by kneeling down to wash their dirty feet. 
something that in their culture a superior rabbi would never do for his disciples. And Jesus says it's a symbol of his entire life purpose to reveal the true nature of God as a being of self-giving love. And it's also a symbol of what Jesus is about to do in becoming a servant and giving up his life to die for the sins of the world. And so this act leads to his great command to his disciples that they are to follow him by loving one another as he has loved them. Acts of loving generosity are to be the hallmark of Jesus' followers. This is what will show the world who Jesus is and therefore who God is. Now from here, Jesus goes into a long flowing speech that's concluded with a prayer. And you'll find the whole thing is unified by a few repeated themes. Jesus keeps saying that he's going away, which makes the disciples sad, but Jesus says it's for the best because it means that he will send the spirit, also known as the advocate. As a human, Jesus can only be in one place at a time, but the spirit can be Jesus' divine personal presence in any place at any time. And the spirit will do a number of things, Jesus says. So remember, for John, the unique deity of the one God consists of that loving, unified relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus says the spirit is that loving, personal presence that will come to live in his people and draw them into the love between the Father and the Son. And so, Jesus says, his disciples are the ones who abide or remain in that divine love, the way the branches are connected to a vine. He's describing here how the personal love of God can permeate a person's life, healing, transforming, and making them new. And there's more. The Spirit will also empower Jesus' followers to carry on his mission in the world, to first of all fulfill the great command to love others through radical acts of service. But also, Jesus says, the mission is to bear witness to the truth, to expose and name the selfish, sinful ways that we as humans treat each other, and to declare that in Jesus, God has saved the world through him because he loves it. He's opened up a new way to become human again. And so finally, Jesus predicts that there will be opposition. Just as the Jewish leaders rejected him, so his followers will be persecuted. But he tells them not to be afraid because he has already conquered or gained victory over the world. Now, what does Jesus mean by victory here? He doesn't say. But it leads us into the final section of the book where John shows us what victory looks like Jesus style. The Jewish leaders send soldiers to Jesus and his disciples to arrest him. And when the soldiers ask which one Jesus is, he declares, I am. And they fall backward. Now, this is brilliant on John's part. These words are the culmination of two sets of seven instances where Jesus has used that very phrase. And it all highlights one of John's core claims about Jesus. The words I am, or in Greek, ego and me, they're the Greek translation of the Hebrew personal covenant name of God that was revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. It was also repeated many times in Isaiah. And John has strategically placed seven moments in his story where Jesus says, I am, followed by some astounding claim. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. And John's also designed seven other stories that have key moments where Jesus says simply, I am, echoing this divine name. And so here, this occurrence, as Jesus is arrested, is the ironic climax of all of them, because Jesus reveals his divine name and power and victory precisely at the moment that he gives up his life. After this, Jesus is put on trial for his exalted claims to be the Son of God and the King of Israel, first before the high priest and then before the Roman governor Pilate, who has to take seriously anyone who's charged with claiming to be the King of Israel. And Jesus tells Pilate that, my kingdom is not from this world, meaning that he is a king and that his kingdom is for this world. But it's radically different value system. It's redefinition of power and greatness. None of this is derived from this world. Rather, they are defined by God's character that Jesus has revealed through his upside down kingdom, which is epitomized by the cross. It's the place where the world's true king conquers sin and evil by letting it conquer him. And Jesus gains victory over the world through an act of self-giving love. After this, Jesus' body is placed in a tomb that is then sealed. And on the first day of the week, Mary and then later the other disciples discover that the tomb is strangely open and then empty. 
And then Mary, all of a sudden, she meets Jesus. He's alive from the dead. Now, the resurrection of Jesus connects back to another pattern of sevens in John's gospel. So all the way back at the wedding party in Cana, when Jesus turned the water into wine, John told us that that was Jesus' first sign. And he also identified the second sign, the healing of the sick boy in chapter 4. But after this, John just lets you keep count. And if you have, you'll have noticed that the sixth sign was the raising of Lazarus from the tomb, which Jesus performed at the cost of his own life. And so that and all of the signs, they point forward to this seventh and greatest sign at the culmination of the story, Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. It vindicates Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, the author of all life, whose love has conquered death itself. After the empty tomb, Jesus then meets up with all the disciples, and he commissions them by sending the Spirit as he promised, so that his mission from the Father can now be carried on through them. After this, the book concludes with an epilogue that explores the ongoing mission of Jesus' disciples in the world. So a number of them are fishing, and they're not catching anything. And so Jesus appears to them on the shore. They don't recognize him, though. And he tells them to cast their net on the other side of the boat. And when they obey him, they catch a huge amount of fish, and it's only then that they recognize him as Jesus. Now, John's offering here a picture of discipleship to Jesus. His followers will be most effective in the world when their focus is not on their work as such, but on simply listening for Jesus' voice and obeying him when he speaks. That's when they will truly see him at work in their lives. After this, Jesus talks with Peter and then commissions him as a unique leader in the Jesus movement, indicating that he too will give up his life one day. But in contrast to Peter, the last moments of the story focus on the author of this gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And unlike Peter, his job was not to lead the Jesus movement, but rather to spend his long life bearing witness to Jesus so that others might believe in him. And that's actually what he's done right here by authoring this amazing story about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's what the Gospel of John is all about. Okay, let's see how Ms. Haley does on this one. There's a few more questions on this part. All right, maybe Laurel, I can jump in if she knows an answer, okay? Go get big ass. All right, so in the second part of John's divided into two big parts, John, uh, Jesus did something extra special for his disciples to show his love for them and to represent his life. What act of service am I talking about? Was it washing their feet? It was washing their feet. That was um, kind of one of the things that um, someone above you would never, ever do. And so that was um, a very humbling act of service, which was to represent his life um, and his death and resurrection. And so next, we're going to talk about the seven names that Jesus gives himself um, using the phrase, I am. Now, to make it easy, we're going to fill in the blanks, okay? So we don't have to know all seven right now. All right, so uh, first one is, okay, so Lorla and Haley, y'all just jump in, okay? Whoever knows it first, all right? I am the bread of life. And I am the light of the world. Okay, say it like you know it. Okay, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the blank shepherd. Good, good. I am the resurrection. Oh, I said that one. Okay. <laughs> I am the blank and the blank and the blank. I am the, the way, way, the truth, truth, and the life. There you go. And I am the true vine. vine. All right. Good job. So Jesus dies on the cross. He's resurrected. He leaves some instructions for all of his followers, okay? What are these instructions? And I want you to think about when the disciples were fishing, what did Jesus tell them to do? He told them to listen, to follow, and to obey. He did. He said, don't always work, don't always uh, pay close attention, such close attention to your actual job that you're doing, but pay attention to what I'm telling you to do, okay? And so we're going to love Jesus, we're going to listen to him, and we're going to obey him, and in those ways, we honor him and we show him our love. Um, so we're going to pray, 
and we hope that you learn some things about the book of John today. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for so much that we learn, Father. I pray that you would lead us and guide us, and um, Father, that we would acknowledge you as the only way, the only truth, the only life, Father, and uh, we just love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.